spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long Drugs. Well, aloha and good morning. Thank you so much for joining us here on this Wednesday morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Ianji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, Ianji, we are spotlighting the economy and talking about some of what we can expect to see in the months and potentially years to come. That's right. We have brought in the key expert this morning, Yuhiro Executive Director. Of course, that stands for University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization. Do uh, Professor Carl Bonham is joining us this morning. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Aloha. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty in a moment, but let's start with broad strokes. In your estimation, how is Hawaii doing when it comes to our economy, particularly in this sort of strange phase as we transition, I would say, to maybe page two of the pandemic. Not quite done, but certainly not where we were two years ago. Well, we're, we're certainly still in recovery mode. Um, you know, it's by our estimate, if you look at July, so we, we do a, a calculation where we, we come up with our own estimates of payroll jobs this time of year um, to take into account revisions that are going to happen. And by our estimate, we're in July, we're 7% below where we were for payroll jobs right before we entered the pandemic. And so there, there's still a ways to go for, um, you know, by that measure, uh, but it's difficult to, to really nail down what uh, sort of what the new normal will be uh, because we've changed so much of how we do business and, and uh, you know, and the labor force is, has declined and the labor market is, is very tight. Uh, businesses are having a hard time finding uh, finding workers. Uh, it's actually been a pretty remarkable recovery. The unemployment rate in Hawaii is down to 4.1%. 4, 4 That's about, it's almost 30,000 people. Uh, and yet uh, businesses will report that they have a very high, hard time finding workers. Um, actually, if you look at the, the data uh, in Hawaii, there's one and a half job openings for every unemployed person. That's not even as high as it was back in 2018 and 2019. It, it temporarily peaked above above that level, uh, but I get to some extent. I think we forget how how tight Hawaii's labor market uh, has been in the past. And nationally, there's two job openings for every unemployed person. So we're while Hawaii's labor market has recovered quite markedly, uh, we're still lagging the U.S. Uh, pretty substantially. The U.S in the last job report, we'll get another one on Friday, they've completely recovered all of the all of the lost jobs. And the unemployment rate nationally is three and a half percent. So Hawaii is still is still lagging. Um, and, you know, frankly, we don't have uh, job count numbers fully recovered uh, for uh, an extended period of time, partly because of the decline in population and the, and the decline in the labor force. I want to expand a little bit more on the, that labor uh, issue that we're seeing here, both locally and nationally. You know, we had Senator Brian Schatz on this program on Monday, and he described it uh, almost like, you know, the U.S. economy has never been put on hold, uh, never been shut down. And all of a sudden we've had to start it up. So starting it back up again will take some time, almost like if you're shutting off plumbing and you turn on the water right after it takes some time for things to flow free, uh, water to flow freely out of this uh, spout, if you will. Uh, what do you attribute some of the issues that we're seeing with the labor? Is it because of the decline of population and just not enough people? Uh, is it the pay increases that we're seeing as well? Uh, how do you, how would you describe uh, this situation that we're in and how do we get out of it? So, you know, the example that I like to give is, and this is not just about labor markets, it's about, you know, all of the supply chain issues that, that we're facing. So you think about what happens on the H1 when there's an accident and they shut down all but one lane. And then two hours later, they open all the lanes. It still takes the whole day to get, you know, to get the freeway running again. And, and that's kind of what we're dealing with, except that we shut down the freeway multiple times 
over it would be like you had an accident in the morning and you had another one in the afternoon and the kind of gridlock that that can create and that you know that's true in you know computer chips and new cars and in um, commodities and some food services and in the labor market and and you know in some sectors of the economy where uh you know say nationally in the uh in the airlines for example when you have when you lose pilots or you let pilots go or you they early retire it takes even longer to get those skilled workers back into the into the jobs and, and so really you know the pandemic disrupted everything and uh, one of the things that that means is that we won't fully understand all of the the minute issues that impacted labor markets for years to come. It's going to take years for us to gather all the data uh, that will will help us to fully understand. Uh, in Hawaii, we've we faced a whole variety of factors: a declining population, um, a, a an older population, uh, many of which decided to leave the the labor force, right? So you already had a situation where uh, with, with an aging population, you were going to see a decline in working age population. The older, the older adults were going to retire. And so that was accelerated during the pandemic, right? It, the, the pandemic caused things to, to happen faster, particularly early in the pandemic, whether it was someone moving or someone uh, leaving a job and retiring. And then uh, now we may very well be dealing with uh, long-term effects of COVID. The, if you look at the survey work that Ruben Juarez and Tim Halliday and uh, Daniela Von Smith did for UHERO in our, in our public health uh, research, uh, we're finding that something on the order of 25% of people who had COVID are experiencing long COVID symptoms. So if you do the math, this comes out to over 100,000 people from our labor force. Our labor force is only 600,000 people. And, and so those people may very well, they may have one job back, but they don't have their second job back because they're still dealing with COVID symptoms, or maybe they're still caring for, uh, actually, I, I heard before we started that someone's uh, kindergartner had, uh, had, <laughs> had uh, you know, had to stay home. And, and that, that disrupts family, whether you're caring for someone with COVID or you're, you're dealing with it yourself. Uh, and so those are just some of the things, but the, the factors are, are multifold. Uh, and frankly, in Hawaii, uh, if you're not in food service or wholesale trade, um, your wages probably aren't going up as fast as inflation. And so, uh, you know, there's all kinds of reasons that, that people are, are choosing to leave one job and go to another to seek a higher wage, because the people who change jobs are the ones who benefit the most from the tight labor market. Yeah, well, let's expand on that. And full disclosure, that's my uh, three-year-old who's now home Sorry for two that. weeks. No, that's <laughs> quite all right. Full transparency here. Um, and that's just the COVID protocol for his school after an exposure. Um, and so, yeah, that's impacting my work and my husband's work. And I'm certainly not alone in that. Luckily, I have the flexibility where we can care for him. But there are a lot of folks, uh, you know, also in healthcare, when we talk about the tightness in the hospitals, um, just because of these mandatory quarantines, whether folks are vaccinated or not, um, that, you know, we see these ripple effects. Ingrid's got a question that kind of piggybacks on that. Do you think women are still not going back to work due to COVID leading them to stay home for child care or elder care? What, you know, as long as COVID is in our community, it seems like there's going to be quarantine. And so how long is this going to going to go on, do you think? So I can't tell you how long it's going to go on because I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know how long the uh, COVID is going to continue to be this this level of a problem. Uh, I, I, in response to Ingrid's question, I have no doubt that that women are still um, have, in general, have reduced participation uh, in the labor market in some form uh, because they tend to be the primary caregivers for uh, people who are sick. Uh, and, and you, you know, we're talking about quarantines now and, and the way we're dealing with COVID now, but think back to what it was like six months or a year ago when uh, you would might shut down entire schools, right? And the disruption there. And so we're still sort of working our way out of that. Um, the, you know, how effective the, the next vax, next uh, booster shots are and the uptake of those, of those boosters may play a role in changing the rules. We know the CDC has already changed guidance on, uh, on 
quarantining and so we're not shutting down schools anymore when when one person gets sick and if they're fully vaccinated their quarantine uh time is is reduced and so it should continue to improve uh, but frankly that part of of uh, any outlook is is still the most uh the most uncertain piece is what the next wave of of COVID looks like you know, one of the topics that you have to talk about when talk, when discussing Hawaii's economy is the tourism industry. Uh, what can you tell us about the growth that we are seeing there, the rebound after COVID and the numbers uh, that are being reported? We saw some of those pre-pandemic level type of numbers of spending as well as arrivals uh, during these summer months. How do you anticipate the tourism industry impacting the overall health of Hawaii's economy moving forward? Well, you can't escape the fact that the recovery of Hawaii's jobs and income is directly tied to the recovery of tourism. And when, if you go back and look at the progress in our recovery in 2021, uh, the vast majority of that recovery in, in jobs and reducing unemployment and getting, getting income back up happened during the initial surge in, in tourism leading up to summer of 2021. Um, we're, we would expect to see uh, see some of that continue, but it will begin to slow, right? We're we're already at record levels of U.S. visitors, um, but we're not anywhere close to recovery uh, in Japan, right? The Japanese visitor count uh, as of July is down about 94, 95% compared to pre-pandemic. Um, U.S. is plus 16%. And uh, Canadians have almost recovered. I completely recovered. I suspect that this winter we'll see we, we will probably see record numbers of Canadian visitors. Uh, other international are are still lagging, and so the the you know the progress going forward is is really about getting other international visitors, higher spending visitors, other international and Japanese uh, back this winter. That's that's what our forecast is. Um, and yet we don't forecast over the next um, five or six years to see visitor counts, uh, total visitor counts reach the level they were before the pandemic. Um, and, and frankly, uh, real visitor spending. So you take out the effects of inflation, uh, real visitor spending in July was still down uh, five or six percent compared to July of 2019. And so while spending has improved better than, than uh, visitor counts, and that's a that's a positive per person per day spending uh, has risen in, in real dollars, uh, but we don't. This may very well be the peak in real visitor spending. Uh, our our forecasts have real spending relatively flat for the for the next uh, four or five years as we deal with the higher costs, higher inflation, um, and as we deal with uh, a slowing global economy, right? A, a global economy that is sort of um, where a primary concern is, is will we see a global recession? Will we see a recession in the U.S.? And all that will weigh on, on tourism spending in, in 2023, mostly. 2023 may be lingering a little bit into 2024. I'm interested to know, you mentioned inflation. Right now, what do you see as the major pain points for the average Hawaii resident during the uh, lead up to the primary, you heard a lot of talk about different ways that the pol different politicians said that they could address this. Uh, one of the things being proposed by candidate for governor, uh, current Lieutenant Governor Josh Green says that he would eliminate the gas tax, take gas tax. Do you think measures like that can make a difference? And, and what specifically do you see residents struggling with the most? So in inflation is definitely um, causing a lot of pain. And, and actually, we, uh, Stephen Bond Smith, uh, a, a new faculty member at UHERO, and his wife Daniela and I wrote a blog back in the spring that looked at uh, the impacts of inflation. And actually, in March, inflation uh, had was a seven and a half percent year over year for Honolulu. Uh, I, I believe that was the highest the highest point uh, that we've seen on a year over year basis this year. And uh, if inflation had continued, if inflation continued for the whole year uh, at that rate, and that's not too far from what our forecast is for 2022 inflation, um, that's hitting the lowest income households, the bottom 20% of the income distribution. It, if they were to buy the same goods that they bought in previous years, it would cost them more than $3,000 more. 
it's equivalent of a roughly 10% tax on their income. And, and, you know, and where it's, where it's hitting the food prices are up double digits. And so it's, it's really squeezing the uh, lowest income households very, very hard. The, unfortunately, we, we don't think that inflation is over. We think it's peaked. And our forecast for this year was 7%. Uh, I think our forecast for next year is 4%. By the end of next year, we think we'll be back down in the 2 to 3% range, so much, much more normal. Uh, but one of the challenges is this is coming on top of a pullback in federal support. So you may remember all the debate over Build Back Better and and uh, the, the multiple rounds of, of uh, negotiations between a certain senator and, and the administration. Well, the end result was that the child tax credits and the earned income tax credit expansions at the federal level uh, that would have continued if that bill had passed are now gone. And that was $500 million. The child tax credits were $500 million flowing into Hawaii uh, something on the order of $5,000 per low-income household, and all that's gone. And so households that had, had really been lifted up in 2021 are now dealing with higher inflation and uh, the, the loss of that support. As to gas taxes, and there have also been proposals for, for um, exempting food and medicine from Hawaii's excise tax. And uh, Professor, uh, Emeritus Professor, you hear a fellow, uh, Dr. James Mack wrote about that in a in a blog post a couple of weeks ago, and really the takeaway is that uh, making sure that that households in Hawaii who are eligible for um, low income uh, rental assistance, uh, to rental tax credits, and food tax credits, making sure that they claim them and and making those more effective and indexing them to inflation are things that can make a big difference. Uh, exempting the gap the gas tax the challenge there is it's not very targeted it's targeted well at people who drive a lot but it's not targeted by income and and frank and, and actually if you just look at the average amount of money that that would save sort of a typical household uh if we're just talking about the gas tax and not the excise tax then you're talking about a couple hundred dollars a year uh, gasoline is about three percent of the of the typical uh, household budget in hawaii food is a much bigger deal and so making sure that People who are eligible are able to claim the the uh, food excise tax credit and indexing that to inflation. I think would be would be good steps. I want to stay on this topic of just the taxes and and different uh, taxes here in the state. Uh, when you look at the state tax collections from uh, this past year and what the state legislature was able to do with some of the increase in uh, revenue that was brought in funding different programs, it was. One of the few times that the legislators were looking to fund projects rather than cutting back uh, than what we saw in recent years with them having to make some tough decisions, they were able to fund some key projects. What do you see in terms of state tax collections moving forward uh, into this next this year and next year and, and how the legislature did overall in allocating those funds to really help the longevity of some of these projects that are crucial to the economy as a whole? So those are great questions. The, the tax revenue uh, question is one that we'll be taking up, uh, I believe next Tuesday is the Council on Revenues meeting. And so there'll be a new forecast coming out of, out of the Council for tax revenue for the next uh, five fiscal years. And uh, it's always risky to try and predict what the Council is going to predict. Um, you're actually asking me what, what I think tax revenues are. I think the growth rates are going to slow um, and, and maybe they, they could show slow, slow sharply. I don't expect that uh, to happen. Inflation by itself tends to bolster tax revenues because we're paying more for everything and the taxes is on top of that. Um, th I mean, the real, the real issue will be whether or not the, the U.S. economy uh, continues on, on what's really been a tear of uh, economic growth in terms of jobs and, and uh, even, even consumer spending is held up very well if that continues, uh, I, I don't imagine that we're talking about big, big changes in, in those forecasts. The legislature uh, had at their disposal more money than um, than anybody could have expected going going into this pandemic. And I think some of the key things that came out of uh, the legislature, the 
were changes in the earned income tax credit. Um, the minimum wage bill uh, was a very big deal that had, you know, had been attempted year after year after year. Um, the the money that was, you know, was allocated to Hawaiian homes. All of those things are things that uh, were were not possible in previous years because of revenue. But there's still plenty of things that that we need to we need to focus on, whether it's uh, adapting to climate change, um, the you know making sure that we are we not only build classrooms for preschool but uh, fund the teachers for preschool. Uh, all of these things are going to take take revenue, and in order for that to happen, the Hawaii economy has to grow. Uh, and frankly, as we come out of the pandemic, and as we deal with the slowdown globally and in the U.S. in particular. Um, eventually we'll get through some of these shocks and we'll go back to some kind of sort of normal economic growth. And for Hawaii, that normal economic growth is pretty, is pretty weak. Uh, we're talking, uh, you know, per capita real GDP growth of maybe a half of 1%. Um, and that's not enough. That kind of growth of the overall economy won't support the tax revenue growth that you need to fully fund um, you know, preschool for everyone, to uh, deal with the effects of climate change, to invest in our infrastructure, uh, to invest in our, our schools. And, and so another area that you hear always focused on is economic development and Stephen Bond Smith, that's his, his area of research and focusing on you know, diversifying Hawaii's economy and trying to make sure that we have uh, sort of stable sources of growth going forward is, is really important. You know, and and diversifying the economy are definitely buzzwords we heard throughout the election. Um, and, you know, of course, tourism is our bread and butter and the military follows close behind, but I'm interested to know what other sectors you see having the potential for uh, growth and growth in the short term as opposed to things that take a long time to have returns. So I'm not gonna give you a short term solution because there, there isn't one um, and the, and, and and actually, um, I would suggest that one of the challenges that we face is we haven't really done the research um, to fully understand uh, where we should be focusing our efforts. Um, I mean, some of them are quite obvious places where we where we have a comparative advantage, whether it's in um, the things where Hawaii has a natural advantage because of our our natural resources, whether it's Mauna Kea or the, mar the marine marine resources and, and research and R&D around uh, renewable energy. Uh, but what Stephen Bond Smith is working on is, is analyzing the makeup of Hawaii's economy and comparing it with uh, other parts of the, of the country and other parts of the world and, and asking the question, you know, if you look at places that look kind of like Hawaii with similar kind, you know, so with a tourism, heavily tourism industry uh, dominance and, and also military and certain natural resources, um, there are things that we could be doing here or we you would expect to see here that don't exist. And uh, it, the question is, what are they and what do they need to get to have a, a spurt of, say, state resources, maybe an investment in some kind of, of infrastructure that could help them uh, to thrive. And, and so, you know, research and development in renewable energy is one of them. Uh, but frankly, you would think that we would, we would have uh, quite a bit more activity than we do have here. Uh, and so questions, the next question is, once you've identified the area, the next question is, what do we need to do to, to spur that activity? And that's the kind of things that economic development research would inform and help the state and the counties with policies that can can make those happen. But they're not short term, unfortunately. We're, we're almost out of time, but I quickly want to get to uh, just housing and what we're seeing in that market. You know, we saw uh, coming out of the pandemic in the early years, uh, early months, it, just this robust uh, housing market that was booming. Uh, we see a little bit of a slowdown now. What do you forecast or what do you see with Hawaii's housing market as it currently stands and moving forward for the rest of the year? So in our last forecast report, uh, we we forecast that home prices in 2023 would decline slightly, that we would peak uh, this year and the first half of this year uh, for median home prices and median condo prices 
uh, and unfortunately, we only forecast Oahu, but it's uh, the basic pattern would would hold true for the for the rest of the islands. And essentially, a a uh, multi-year slowdown pause in in home prices as sales decline. We've already seen the sales numbers decline, uh, not nearly as sharply as we're seeing nationally. Um, the so inventory is starting to starting to increase in Hawaii, and that's that's primarily because of a reduction in demand. So what we're seeing is, you know, the bottom end of the market. So somebody who who maybe was was thinking about getting into a, a single family home um, is probably now looking at a condo. And someone who was thinking about a condo is now thinking about renting. Um, and I'm talking like median, median price uh, projects simply because of the mortgage rate movement. Uh, well, not just the mortgage rate movement, but also because of the movement upward in prices. So affordability obviously has deteriorated pretty dramatically. Uh, and what that typically means is a multi-year pause in prices going up while income and jobs and other things sort of recover and you know, income starts to uh, catch up with, with those home prices. We are, as Ryan said, just about out of time. Just want to get a final thought from you. I know that you hear will release their forecast in the coming weeks. What do you expect? Just broad strokes. I know you don't want to give it all away, but what do you expect to see out of that? Well, the question it, at, at sort of the front of everybody's mind is whether or not we're going to see a recession in the U.S., whether we're going to see a recession globally. And so that would be our focus. Um, you know, we're we're ex if we do if we do forecast a recession, if that's our ends up being our baseline forecast, uh, it will be a moderate recession or a modest recession nationally. Uh, and I think Hawaii is uh, because we're still in recovery. Right, the the U.S. has already surpassed its previous job counts. Um, the labor market is is still pretty overheated. Um, there's a you know there's a chance that we'll get through this with just a a modest slowdown. Um, sort of a growth recession, if you will, where you continue to grow, but the unemployment rate goes up a little bit, jobs get a little bit harder to find, and inflation comes down. Okay, Professor Carl Bonham, Executive Director of UHERO, thank you so much for your insights, and we will look forward to that forecast in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, always great to hear from him. And we talked about a variety of sectors of the economy. Um, bottom line, it was very interesting to hear about his thoughts on inflation and just how much pain that is causing Hawaii families, uh, particularly those of the lowest income, saying that it amounts to about $3,000 in increased costs uh, for average goods and services. And a lot of that stuff is stuff that you need to buy, food, gas, things like that. Um, he's saying that the gas tax, uh, you know, eliminating that, which is one of the proposals that has been put forth by some candidates for office, uh, doesn't seem like it would make a meaningful difference uh, because it's not very specifically targeted. He suggests perhaps looking more at, you know, food taxes and different areas where you could provide relief to certain sectors of the economy to really help to lift those people through this difficult time. Yeah, and those are some of the same comments and sentiments that we heard from Governor Ige when asked about the gas tax, saying that it would not have a significant impact or not enough of a significant impact to really impact those vis uh, those residents who live here and to be able to affect their day-to-day -day cost of living. Uh, interesting to also hear his take on the labor market. Of course, Hawaii, as well as the rest of the nation, continues to have issues with filling positions with a number of businesses and companies throughout the state that are looking for employee uh, workers and employees, uh, while the you know the job market as a whole and the unemployment rate continues to drop. Uh, he likened it to uh, this situation with the labor market as well as many others, uh, like a traffic accident on the H1 freeway where maybe one lane is open and it takes some time for things to kind of uh, get flowing again, even when the traffic uh, accident is cleared out. And so that will take some time, he says, for not only this labor market, but the economy as a whole to be able to run fle uh, freely on a traffic free H1. <laughs> and he did also note that uh, they're coming out with their forecast in the next three weeks and that uh, they haven't, you know, forecast a recession just yet. They're still, you know, crunching the numbers and figuring that out. But if they do forecast one, they say that it would be a moderate recession. It would have an impact in Hawaii, but it does sound like um, they're not forecasting a lot of doom and gloom, at least as of yet. But we will look for that report, which will be out September 19th from you, Hero. Always really great to get his perspective on Friday we're going to be switching gears and putting the focus on Red Hill and our water sources.
Yeah, we'll be talking with Ernie Lau here on the program to get an update uh, on the defueling of Red Hill, his conversations that he continues to have with the military, as well as uh, other issues that the Board of Water Supply continue to tackle here uh, in our community. So always great to catch up with Ernie Lau and looking forward to that conversation. We hope you'll join us right here at 1030 for another episode of Spotlight Hawaii. Until then, take care and stay safe. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.